Hello, listeners. This is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of Fellow Feeling. This will be Part 3, Chapter 3, entitled Damage Control. Coming back from being knocked unconscious is never a pleasant experience. Shota doesn't know what it's like for other people, but for him, it's always a steady, painful progression, like water trickling into a rusted bowl, each splash disturbing the surface and rippling adding slowly to the puddle until it overflows and his eyes snap open, consciousness flooding back all at once. This time is different. This time he awakens sluggishly, like the normal trickle of water has been reduced to a lethargic drip, taking so long to reach the top of the bowl that he begins to worry that he might never wake up. But of course, he does. The pain won't let him drift away a second time. The pain. As he floats towards awareness, his body screams, his right arm is throbbing like it's been crushed, so agonizing that it's almost numb. And he can feel a tender lump at the back of his head where he'd smacked it against the wall. Definitely a concussion. It's probably the reason he's having such a hard time clinging to consciousness. But he doesn't have time to be unconscious anymore, he thinks, somewhat hysterically. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. It takes a beat for him to remember, because his head is pounding and his arm feels pulverized and... Everything is warm and buzzing and painful, but something clinks to his right, like stone on glass, and his entire body flares with awareness as he remembers. Bakugo. Midoriya. He takes in a sharp, choking breath, coughing dust out of his lungs. His arm burns like fire, and he hisses through his teeth when he realizes that it's pinned beneath what feels like some kind of wooden plank. Luckily, it's light enough to shift with his good arm and he dislodges it with an admittedly agonizing but manageable push. Something clatters somewhere off to his side, and he opens his eyes. Dark. It's so dark. Because his mind is running a bit slow at the moment, it takes him a beat to realize what's happened. He's been buried. The industrial complex has collapsed on top of him, on top of his students, and he's currently lying beneath what's probably several tons of concrete and steel. It's a miracle that he hasn't been crushed. Something must be supporting the pocket he's buried in, keeping him from being completely flattened. And while he's thankful, he's also immediately on edge. Because he has no idea how large this pocket is, or if Midoriya and Bakugo have made it to safety. And he can't stomach the thought of having gotten them killed, especially not on a patrol that he had organized. He desperately hopes that they've managed to survive the building's collapse, but even if they have... He winces, remembering with vivid clarity the moment those dripping claws had sunk into Midoriya's sides, leaving behind a set of deep, deadly gashes. He hadn't had the chance to look him over too closely before the collapse, but he knows that those wounds are severe. And if the villain's venom has the ability to kill... Bakugo isn't out of the woods either. Shota had seen the protective rubber of his arm wraps tear, had seen those claws nip into his skin. Pinpricks won't kill him, but the venom might. Something clatters again, something to his right, and Shota forces himself to roll onto his side. He has to move. And he has to move now. Midori and Bakugo could be dying, he can't just lie here. Not to mention, he hadn't seen the villain go down. He could still be here somewhere, hunting them. Where is Ryuku? As his eyes adjust to the darkness, he realizes that he can see, at least a little bit. There must be light filtering in from somewhere, just enough for him to be able to see the silhouette of his good arm when he raises it in front of him. Another clatter, a low groan, hoarse and gravelly. Shota struggles to his knees, looking in the direction of the noise, as if he'll be able to pinpoint its source through the murky darkness, and is pleasantly surprised to find that the pocket he's buried in isn't as small as he'd thought. In fact, it seems like it extends quite some ways. When he reaches up with his good arm, his fingers just barely touch the jagged ceiling. Not enough room to stand, but enough to shuffle on his knees. It'll have to do. He moves in the direction of the clattering, keeping low and quiet. It's possible that the villain is the one making all that noise, and he doesn't want to alert him to his presence. But as he draws closer, he hears a quiet curse and the pop of a tame explosion, and he lets out a relieved breath. Bakugo. There's an undignified yelp, then shakily. Aizawa-sensei. Shota frowns. Bakugo's voice is trembling, his breast low and ragged sounding as if he's just barely holding back his panic. It's unlike him, because even though he knows that Bakugo is far less confident than his friends might believe, Shota has never seen combat scare him like this. Even when he'd been captured by the League, 
He had been able to stay calm and rational long enough for the pros to arrive. But now... Are you injured? Shota presses because he knows something must be wrong. Another breath, choppy like he's having to struggle to take in air. I... I'm fine, he manages, though he sounds anything but. Knocked my head on the way down. and I think I sprained my ankle, but I'm not bleeding. Then why does he sound so terrified? What about your arm? Do you feel... The building groans around them, something buzzing and electrical filling the air, and Shota squints as dull, yellow light trickles through the pocket they're trapped in. Emergency generators. It's a miracle they're still working. They must be somewhere beneath the blast zone. When he looks back to Bakugo, able to see his injuries for the first time, his chest tightens. It's not life-threatening. True to his word, there are no gaping wounds or visibly broken bones. But he's pale, trembling as if he's having to hold himself back from attacking or running or something, and his eyes are very slightly glassy. It looks like his nose is broken, too. It's a bit crooked, and there's dried blood on his face, matting his hair where he'd been lying on his side. There's a strip of rubber, probably torn from the lining of his destroyed gauntlets, tied tight around his upper arm. An attempt at a tourniquet, placed tactfully above the shallow scrape in his wrist. Even under immense pressure, Bakugo was a tactical thinker. He'd seen the fluid on the villain's claws, reached the same conclusion as Shota, and made efforts to keep the venom from circulating too quickly. Shota shuffles forward, meaning to get a better look at the claw marks, but Bakugo snarls, retreats like a wild animal, curling in on himself, bracing against a large chunk of debris behind him as if he's intending to attack. Bakugo, he says, stunned, and he can't get any further than that. The kid winces, squeezing his eyes shut as if in preparation to be struck. Sorry. He chokes, sounding like he swallowed a mouthful of gravel. Fuck. I don't know what's happening. I'm just... Terrified. It's written all over his body, shining in his eyes like a fever. He's fighting a war with himself because he knows that Shota isn't going to hurt him, but his irrational side is screaming at him to run. Shota sits back, worried. Being trapped under tons of rubble with a terrified, explosive child doesn't bode particularly well. But why is he so afraid? He'd pass it off as trauma resulting from Bakugo's recent kidnapping, but that doesn't seem right. No, this is something else. The fever shined to his eyes, the way he's fighting with himself, fighting with his instincts. His eyes skirt down Bakugo's arm, slightly red from lack of circulation, and it all clicks together. The fluid on the villain's claws, he says. The venom. I think it's targeting the part of your brain that handles your perception of fear. Bakugo gives a frantic laugh, shaking his head as if he can dislodge the terror that spikes along his skin. Should have known. I'm not supposed to be this. He waves a helpless hand, seemingly unable to come up with the right word. But Shota secretly suspects that the word Bakugo is reaching for is weak. Can I see your arm? Shota requests, keeping his voice carefully level. If Bakugo is primed to explode at the slightest disturbance, he has to make sure that he sounds as calm and confident as possible. Bakugo is prone to violence at the best of times. Things could turn sour quickly. Luckily, that doesn't happen. Though Bakugo's eyes are still glassy and distant, and it takes visible effort to uncurl from his protective stance, he extends a hesitant arm in Shota's direction. Cautious, but not aggressive. It's a good sign. He takes Bakugo by the forearm, drawing him closer. The light is low and yellowish, making it slightly difficult to see, but he still isolates the scrapes on his wrist with relative ease. They're shallow. The claws had barely broken the skin. Not much of the venom would have been able to get into his system. It's probably why he's still coherent, and why he's not currently screaming and exploding everything around him in terror. The tourniquet is probably unnecessary in that case. Plus, it looks like in the midst of his frightened fumbling, he hadn't tied it tight enough to make much of a difference. It's extremely difficult to apply a proper tourniquet with only your bare hands, after all, and especially with shaking hands. Shota moves to untie it, but Bakugo recoils with a vicious snap of his teeth, like some kind of dog. Hands off, he snarls, his free hand popping threateningly. He pulls his arm away. The rubber isn't doing anything. It's probably fine to leave alone if Bakugo is this concerned about it. But still, the fact that he's this scared due to a few drops of venom is probably a bad sign for... Midoriya. A chill races up Shota's spine as he realizes that in his relief at finding Bakugo alive and his urgency in addressing his injuries, he let Midoriya's wound slip his mind. He curses under his breath, drawing back to scan the pocket they're trapped in. 
He can't immediately see Midoriya, but the light is so dull that he might just blend in with all the rubble. He needs to find him, but leaving Bakugo alone would be incredibly stupid. The gashes in Midoriya's torso flash through his mind, bright red and gushing, and he knows he doesn't have a choice. Bakugo, he says at last. Do you think you can stay put while I take care of something? I won't be gone long. Bakugo's eyes widen at the thought of being left on his own, but then he clenches his jaw, steeling himself, and says, I won't move. The Venom can do whatever the fuck it wants. I'm not running. He's shaking, though. He's holding back his terror, but only slightly. Shota sighs. Stay right here. Don't move. Just keep your eyes closed and count your breaths. Three seconds in, three seconds out. Understand. He turns his chin up. I'll be fine. So stop worrying. I'm not worried, Shota tells him for his sake. Because of course he is worried. Though they've pinpointed the main effect of the venom, it's entirely possible that it has the secondary effect of being extremely toxic. He'll have to keep an eye on Bakugo to make sure that he doesn't keel over as a result of being dosed with the stuff. But he can't afford to delay any longer, not when Midoriya could be bleeding out. He has to trust Bakugo to keep breathing and stay calm as he begins the search for his other missing student. It becomes quickly obvious that Midoriya isn't anywhere in the narrow pocket Shota is kneeling in. It stretches, for maybe twenty feet in every direction, the rubble ceiling too low to stand beneath, and though Shota looks everywhere he can reach, he isn't able to find even a flicker of green among the drab, gray stone. Then, just as his heart is beginning to pound with fear, he sees it, a narrow gap at the edge of the air pocket, dropping sharply down into what looks like some kind of basement, and because it's the only accessible place he hasn't searched, he slips through the gap and lands lightly in what looks like a relatively untouched room. He does mean relatively, too. The entire left half of the room has been buried in rubble, and the back wall has been blown out, scattering the floor with dust and chunks of stone. Still, the space that's left behind is large enough to stand and walk around in. Though most of the lights have been shattered by the collapse, one singular bulb remains, illuminating the space with a dim glow. Which is how Shota pinpoints, at the very back of the room, a limp splay of green at the edge of the rubble. He can't move quickly enough. As he crosses the room, his fears are confirmed, as the blur of green sharpens into a person, into Midoriya, lying in a pool of red. There's so much to take in that he doesn't even know where to start. Blood has gathered beneath his student's body in a thick puddle, dripping in sticky rivulets from his soaked hero costume. A gash below his eyes, leaking blood down his cheek, oozing sluggishly as it begins to coagulate. One of his legs is... pinned, Shota realizes, held down by the wall of rubble and there's a smear of red on the ground beneath it. But the most horrifying part is the fact that Midoriya is still conscious. It's good that he's conscious. Being conscious means that he isn't dead. But what isn't good is that Midoriya is sobbing, his breath coming in ragged, desperate gasps, yanking at his trapped leg as if he thinks he can dislodge a ton of rubble with his bare hands. Every movement sends another pulse of blood dripping from his sides, joining the sickening puddle beneath him. And Shota goes cold all over as he realizes that the kid has lost a lot of blood, too much blood. Midoriya! The kid screams, lashing out with an arm and punching with frenzied terror in Shota's direction. Wind pressure shoots violently through the tiny room and Shota has to jump to one side to avoid a chunk of debris that dislodges from the ceiling as a result. His broken arm screams at the motion. Above him, something groans, some bit of steel or concrete, and his heart leaps. He erases Midoriya's quirk just before he throws a second punch, remembering, right, if Bakugo was having a hard time containing his fear, with just a few drops of venom in his bloodstream, Midoriya must be beside himself. He's probably not even coherent. Dad? whispers Midoriya's soft, delirious voice in the back of his mind, and Shota's stomach makes a concerted effort to send that morning's breakfast back up his throat. Midoriya lashes out again, seeming confused that his quirk isn't working, and something cold drops in Shota's gut, like a stone, as he realizes that his suspicions had been correct. The kid doesn't know where he is, what's going on, or even who Shota is. All he knows is that he's terrified and in pain, and he's trying to free himself. But he's also bleeding out, his every movement forcing more and more blood from his wounds, and Shota can't afford to wait any longer to get this under control. He takes a step forward, and Midoriya whimpers and thrashes like he expects to be killed. Shit, this is going to suck. Okay, Midoriya, he says breathless. I'm going to have to pull you out of there and bind your injuries. I'm not going to hurt you, so do you think you can stay calm? Nothing. His eyes are blank. Shota drops to his knees, 
shuffling until he manages to catch Midoriya's wrists in his hand as he lashes out at him, which is good, he can restrain him like this, but he can't restrain him and apply pressure to his wounds, especially not with a broken arm. Midoriya whines when he feels Shota's fingers curling around his wrists, yanking with what little remains of his strength. Don't, he begs, almost hysterically. Please, I can't, I can't take this, not again. Hard in his throat, Shota holds Midoriya's arms firmly, refusing to let him thrash so hard that he hurts himself. His struggling is restrained now, reducing his blood loss, but he can't do anything about the gashes in his sides like this. He has to calm him down, at least for a moment. Tucking both of Midoriya's wrists under one arm, he taps lightly at his cheek. Midoriya. He tries again. Then, Izuku. And when that too gets no response, he goes out on a limb and tries, Deku. At the sound of his hero name, Midoriya stills slightly. His eyes are high and bright with feverish terror, his skin pale from blood loss, and he stares sightlessly up at the man looming over him. His breath hitches, like he is trying to put something together, but he doesn't speak. I need to treat your injuries, Shota says, loud and deliberately slow. You have to stay still. Midoriya blinks at him, but he doesn't seem to understand what he's saying. They don't have time for this. Shota takes advantage of the moment of stillness to unwind his capture weapon from around his shoulders. It's not ideal. Without this, he's as good as defenseless against that villain. But it's strong and absorbent, and there's a lot of it and right now it seems like the best substitute for a bandage. Taking a chance at being punched, Shota releases Midoriya's arms and forcibly tilts him halfway onto his side, as far as his pinned leg will allow. He expects to be attacked immediately, but instead Midoriya's breathing grows shallow and pained, and he sniffles, like a little kid, tears rolling down his face and mixing with the blood drying there to form a sickening wash of pink. And Shota realizes with a wave of nauseating dread that the blood loss is taking its toll. He has no idea how long it's been since the building collapsed, and Midoriya has been bleeding freely for all that time, so delirious that he'd been more concerned with freeing his leg than applying pressure to the life-threatening wounds in his side. And now, with that dark, horrific puddle only growing beneath his body, he's beginning to weaken. Moving in quick, desperate motions, Shota loops his capture weapon around Midoriya's torso the best he can with only one intact arm. He pulls it tight, prompting a pained gasp and winds it as securely as he can around what he can see of the wounds. He doesn't have time to get a better look at them. He has to get the bleeding under control now. He just hopes that this will be enough to keep him alive until they can get out of here. By the time he finishes binding the wounds, Midoriya is trembling and silent. For a moment, he feels slightly reassured, thinking that the kid has snapped out of it, enough to recognize that he's trying to help him. But then he sees the silent tears dripping from Midoriya's eyes the resigned, almost blank expression on his face, and he realizes that things are even worse than before. Midoriya is waiting to die, waiting for Shota to kill him. It's been a long time since Shota has so much as felt the urge to cry, but as Midoriya lies there, pinned and bleeding and terrified, the tug in his chest is almost unbearable. At the other end of the room, bits of stone clatter down from the gap in the ceiling. Shota whirls around, ready for a fight, and sees... I told you to stay put. Bakugo hits the ground with a huff, backing himself into a corner just long enough to assure himself that the room is safe. Heard screaming, is his explanation, his eyes flicking from side to side. And there was a huge rumble, like an earthquake. Did you find... Then his eyes find Midoriya, and he goes white as a sheet. Shota isn't sure what he's expecting. Yelling, screaming, panic... None of those reactions would have surprised him, not with the venom currently filtering through Bakugo's system. But what he doesn't expect is for Bakugo to slide down the wall, hitting the ground like he's seen a ghost, overcome with silent horror. Swallowing hard, Shota turns his attention back on Midoriya. He's breathing but barely conscious, eyes rolling beneath their lids. He has to get him out from under that pile of rubble. If Ryuku arrives with paramedics, they'll need to begin treatment immediately. Midoriya can't spare the precious few minutes it would take to dig him out. And if the building continues to collapse, jostled by their efforts to excavate the debris, Midoriya could be crushed with no hope of running away. Bakugo, he says, then stops to swallow again, his mouth dry as paper. I need you to help me pull Midoriya free. And the answer is a simple and resounding no. He barely stops himself from imploding then and there. I know you don't get along with Midoriya, but he could die if you don't help me get him out of here. 
So put your petty feud aside for one second and help me lift this. Bakako tenses, curling back as if in preparation to attack whoever gets close to him. Feud, he echoes, almost frantic. Is that what you think this is? Bakako, get over here now. He jolts and Shota immediately regrets being so harsh. He is still under the effects of the villain's quirk after all. But Midoriya is barely clinging to consciousness, and they need to get him out from under that mountain of rubble before he becomes unresponsive. Bakugo approaches stiffly, like he's forcing himself to move. He's looking everywhere but at Midoriya, like the sight of his classmate is too much to bear. Shota will deal with that later. My arm is broken, so you'll have to lift the rubble. As soon as you lift it high enough, I'll pull Midoriya free. Bakugo releases a shaking breath. Shit, he whispers so quiet that it's barely audible. Then he nods, desperately avoiding looking directly at his classmate's injuries as he kneels beside his pin leg. He wedges his fingers beneath the rubble and tests its weight. Okay, I... I can live this. Ready? He nods, curling his good hand in the front of Midoriya's costume. Ready. There's a pause as Bakugo breathes raggedly, trying to steel himself. Then he heaves, using what remains of his strength to push up against the rubble, and Shota has to move quickly. There is a split second when the weight lifts, when Midoriya's expression twists with pain, and he pulls him out of danger. The wall of rubble groans as it's set back down without Midoriya's leg to sit atop, threatening to topple over, but it doesn't, and Shota is quick to drag his injured student out of the range of the potential collapse, leaving a long, bloody trail in his wake. By the time the dust settles, Midoriya has gone completely limp. For a moment, Shota panics, thinking that the trauma had been too much, that he'd succumbed to his wounds. But then he feels his pulse, high and reedy and distressed, thrumming against his fingers and he relaxes just slightly. It looks like the bleeding has slowed. There's a red stain kissing the outer edges of his capture weapon, but it hasn't soaked completely through, which is a good thing. His leg also looks better than he'd expected. It's scraped and bruised, possibly fractured, but it's not broken. But that doesn't mean he's safe, far from it. Regardless of whether or not the bleeding has slowed, he's still bleeding and he's lost enough blood already to put his life in danger. Between that and the venom coursing through his veins, the situation is dire. He has a decision to make, Shota realizes. He has no idea how deep they're buried, or if Ryuku knows what happened. He doesn't know where the villain is, he doesn't know how much time Midoriya has, or how his body will handle the massive amount of venom in his system. He doesn't know anything, and now he has to decide what to do. Should they stay put and wait for help, or should they try to find a way out? All of his field training says that he should stay right where he is and wait for extraction. The best way to be found is to stay put, after all. But when he looks at Midoriya, unconscious and losing blood quickly, he isn't sure they can afford to wait. Moving him would be extremely dangerous, enough to jostle his wounds and increase his bleeding, perhaps to the point of death. But is taking the risk better than just waiting here while he bleeds out? He wishes he knew where Ryuku was. Sensei comes a hoarse voice from behind him, and he turns to see Bakugo staring determinedly at the ground. Is he... Shota purses his lips. He's alive. It doesn't seem to make Bakugo feel any better. He drops to his knees with a huff, burying his face in his hands, and trembles silently as the venom continues to do its work. And as he looks at him, looks at Midoriya, he feels the responsibility of their lives settle across his shoulders more heavily than ever before. He's the reason they're here. He'd taken them on this supposedly safe patrol so they could deal with their trauma in a healthy way. And now here they are, terrified and injured, and Shota isn't even sure that Ryuku knows they're buried. After his many years of hero work, Shota knows better than to blame himself for things he can't control. He knows this isn't his fault, not really, but still. Bakugo gives a hysterical laugh, tugging at his hair. Stupid he mutters, though Shota isn't immediately sure which one of them he's talking about. Stupid, stupid, should have known that this would happen sooner or later. Shota doesn't ask him to clarify. He has bigger problems right now. But somewhere in the back of his mind, Midoriya's voice whispers, Not again. And he wonders. He lays a few fingers on Midoriya's wrist, gauging his pulse. It's extremely fast, dangerously fast even, fluttering like hummingbird wings against his fingers probably means that he won't be unconscious for long, that the fear is keeping him from slipping under too deeply. He wonders if Midoriya will be more coherent when he awakens, if the venom will have worked its way through his system, but he doubts it. Bakugo is clearly still being affected, and there's only a few drops in his blood. For all he knows, 
Midoriya has received a lethal dose. Fear can kill a person, can it? Make their heart beat so hard and so fast that it just... gives out. And Midoriya's pulse is so quick. Between that and the blood loss... It's a race against time. They have to get out of here. Bakugo, I want you to look for an exit point. Show to orders, because it'll both keep him distracted and give them a shot at escaping from beneath the building. It doesn't have the intended effect. Bakugo goes tense and drawn as a live wire, eyes flicking between Midoriya and the rest of the room. And Shota realizes. He doesn't want to leave Midoriya. The realization is confusing, to put it lightly. Bakugo can't seem to bring himself to look at his classmate for more than a moment, his fear is so great. Why wouldn't he want to get as far away as possible? It must be the venom, he reasons. It's making him afraid of everything, and that fear must have hooked itself into the idea of Midoriya dying, while he's searching the rebel for a way out. The venom must be overriding his usual anger and animosity. Sighing, Shota gets to his feet. Okay, you can stay here while I look but you have to keep an eye on his pulse. Can you do that? Bakugo gives a stiff nod. Shota steps away, watching as Bakugo takes his place. He's still refusing to look at Midoriya, but he forces himself to set two fingers to his throat, where he can feel the pulse the strongest. He closes his eyes, as if that's the only way he can stomach it. Leaving the two where they are, Shota goes to search the rest of the room. He's not expecting to find anything, of course. The space is already small. Most of it is buried beneath mountains of rubble. If there was a way out, he would have already seen it. Except, as he approaches the far corner, he realizes that there is something he'd missed. A narrow maintenance hatch in the ground, half buried in the rubble but otherwise untouched, presumably leading down into the service tunnels that run beneath the city. Dropping to his knees, Shota uses his good arm to sweep away the rubble and yank open the hatch. It's unlocked, thank God, and he's able to pry the metal cover off without too much effort. And beneath it, he finds exactly what he'd been hoping for. A way out. It's dim, but he can just make out the outline of a tunnel stretching two ways from the entry point. There are these dull, orangey light bulbs every several feet along the walls, lighting the way along the concrete tunnel. If they walk far enough, they should find another hatch. Bakugo can blow it up if it's locked, and then they can escape into a building that hasn't collapsed and seek medical aid. Still, the tunnel is damp and cold and Midoriya is seriously injured. Moving him would be a huge risk, one that they shouldn't take unless they absolutely need to. Ryuku must be searching for them. She must know that the building has collapsed by now, and she must have realized that Shota had failed to get back in touch with her after the villain had fled away. Shota has seen no sign of his phone in the rubble, after all, and he can't exactly radio for help without, well, a radio. If they can just hold out until she arrives, they can spare Midoriya the journey and pass him straight into the arms of the paramedics. But if Ryuku doesn't find them in time, they'll just have to hold out for as long as they can. If the situation becomes too serious and it looks like Midoriya's condition is deteriorating too quickly, they'll risk going through the tunnels. Until then, the most he can do is make sure that Midoriya rests comfortably. Hey, he's waking up! Already. Shota steps away from the hatch, hurrying back to where Bakugo is gripping Midoriya's wrist. He'd expected Midoriya to awaken soon, but this is extremely fast. The fear must be jolting him awake. You should stay back, Shota cautions as Midoriya starts to stir, his breath quickening. He tried to attack me earlier. Bakugo's expression goes bitter, almost resentful. I'm not surprised. He got dosed with a lot of that shit, didn't he? The idiot must have been terrified when he saw you. He didn't seem particularly coherent, Shota confirms. I suppose I should have expected him to attack, given how disoriented he was. That's not what I meant. He blinks. Then what... Midoriya groans, rolling his head to the side, and both of their attention drops from the conversation to the boy between them. Get back, Shota tries just one last time, but Bakugo bares his teeth like a wild animal and digs his heels in, refusing to look at Midoriya but refusing to leave. What is with these two? Midoriya makes another noise, low and hurt, and tries to roll onto his side. The pain in his sides must stop him, though, because he falls onto his back with a gasp. Any other time, Shota would try to talk to him, steady him, as he regains consciousness. But as things are now, he worries that Midoriya might kill himself trying to fight if he realizes that he's in the room. Whatever underlying fear he has of teachers, it's working against him now. Shota can see it, the moment the fear begins to take over again. His breathing grows short and panicked, probably as a result of the pain and lack of mobility. 
and he gives this heartbreaking whimper as he tries again to roll onto his side. Bakugo's teeth snap into his bottom lip at the sound, expression creasing painfully. He says nothing, eyes fixed determinedly on the wall, but Shota can tell that Midoriya's fear is making him afraid, too. A feedback loop with potentially deadly consequences. He has to get control of the situation. Now. Bakugo. He begins, trying to be quiet, but it doesn't matter. The instant Midoriya hears his voice, it all goes to hell. He barely erases Midoriya's quirk in time, one of the kid's fists flying in his direction without restraint. If not for the quick erasure, Shota is sure that Midoriya's arm would be shattered. But erasing his quirk makes him go ballistic. Midoriya cries out in a mixture of terror and pain, flailing as if he can throw off his invisible attacker. And he's going to open his wounds again, damn it, but Shota can't do anything without... Bakugo's hand lands on Midoriya's chest, shoving him back down almost viciously, and Shota is horrified, waiting for the inevitable snapback of terror and violence, but it just... doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Deku! Bakugo snarls, finally looking directly at him. Calm down! Midoriya's breath catches in his throat. His arm flies up, grasping at the finger snarled in the front of his costume, but Bakugo doesn't flinch as jagged, bloody fingernails cut into his skin. Bakugo shoots a venomous look in Shota's direction. Return his quirk, he says, low and serious. Then when he hesitates, I said, return his quirk, you idiot. He could bring the building down. I'm not risking our lives just because you... You're making him panic, is the furious response. The last thing he needs is to think he doesn't have a quirk. Give it back. He gives it back. Midoriya slumps, gasping like a great weight has just been lifted off of his chest. And though Shota coils in preparation to erase his quirk again, recognizing the telltale crackle of energy atop his skin, he never gets the chance. Bakugo grips Midoriya by the shoulders, forcing him to look directly into his face and snarls. Deku, so help me God, if you throw another punch, I will blast you through the wall. Sit the fuck down and shut the fuck up. Midoriya blinks, then in a wavering, terrified voice. God, John. Who the fuck else would it be? If you keep using your quirk, you're going to bring the rest of the building down on us. Midoriya stares, his eyes still glassy and distant. But something about the situation must register, because the green on his skin flickers once, twice, and dies out completely. Shota nearly falls over, out of sheer shock. Huffing, Bakugo tightens his grip. Look at me. No, look at me, Deku. I know you're freaking out, but you have to breathe. You're under the influence of a quirk and you're hurt. If you move around too much, you're going to bleed to death. That is not the way to handle a panicking hero, but clearly the sound of his voice sets Midoriya off, so he stays quiet and lets Bakugo handle things, which is a thought he never thought he'd have. Midoriya looks at Bakugo like he's some kind of life raft, and he's drowning in the middle of a deep, deep lake. He was here he stutters, almost slurs, and though Shota has no clue what he's talking about, clearly Bakugo does. He's not here, is the vicious response. Fear quirk, remember? It's messing with your head. But I heard him. You heard Aizawa-sensei. You remember him, don't you? It's like talking to a child. Midoriya blinks up at him, hazy with pain, and frowns like he's having a hard time puzzling through Bakugo's words. Not... Not him? Of course not, you moron. Bakugo snaps. If he tried to come near you again, I'd... He cuts himself off at the last moment, mocking tight with a strange mixture of dread and anger. He shoots Shota a glance like he really wishes he wasn't hearing this conversation. And frankly, Shota wishes that too. This seems... private. Midoriya's eyes widen. But... but I can't protect you either. What if... God damn it, Deku. How many times do I need to tell you that I don't need your help? But you did, and I... I w wasn't... Another glance, shot anxiously in Shota's direction. You're fine, he snarls low and serious. So shut up and stay down. A sluggish blink, then Midoriya falls back, his head hitting the ground with a dull thunk, and his eyelids droop. Cold, he murmurs, and it's the last word he gets out before he drops back into unconsciousness. Cold. Bakugo seems just as puzzled. He frowns, untangling his fingers from the front of Midoriya's costume. In what seems like more of a whim than a logical decision, he reaches up and lays a few fingers flat on Midoriya's throat. Then he looks up, and his eyes are wide with renewed fear. Aizawa-sensei, 
he says, and it's all he needs to hear. Midoriya is going into shock. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 3 of Fellow Feeling. Chapter 4 will be up next. I really think the author does an incredible job with this one. I think it's aptly named Damage Control because that's really what Aizawa was doing the whole time, is trying to scramble and do damage control for everything. His slow awakening into consciousness and finding Bakugo and assessing Midoriya's injuries as well, and trying to determine whether or not they should stay where they are or if they should venture to try to find an escape. So I'm really excited for the next chapter of this one. Let me know your thoughts and reactions to this fic so far. And as always, thank you so much for listening.